of Faith in the Base Podcast 056, The Great Commission, Teach. Well now, the fourth command of the Great Commission in its complete sentence form is teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. In my mind, this is the most amazing part of the Great Commission. It is absolutely brilliant. In adding this fourth command to the other three commands of the Great Commission, Jesus has just ensured that the biblical plan of salvation will continue on throughout all generations. Let's break this down and see what else we can discover. The first word of this sentence is teach. This means sending information, passing knowledge, communicating enlightenment. It's a drawing toward knowledge and wisdom. Now, carefully notice the apostles were not told to teach the people everything. They were told to teach them to obey everything. This is interesting. Jesus is calling people not to simply learn, but to obedience. Obedience is a response and, as such, is always intrinsically linked to a command. Without a command, there's nothing to obey. This is why we say the Great Commission must be obeyed. There are a series of commands contained in it, which I am calling the four crisp commands. Go, make, baptize, and teach. Now, knowing this, we come to understand obedience becomes a critical part of the salvation experience. Why? Well, because the scriptures teach elsewhere that we cannot have a relationship with God if we are not willing to obey him. More on that in a moment. Now, obviously, the things Jesus is commanding us to obey extend way beyond the first three commands of the Great Commission. He said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Really? <laughs> obey everything? That's a mighty tall order, wouldn't you say? What was he talking about? Love your enemies? Love your neighbors as yourself? Seek first the kingdom? Give? Yes, 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 and yes. But in context of the Great Commission, we must ask, what has he just taught the apostles to obey? Well, the first three commands. Go, make, baptize. When Jesus says, teach them to obey everything, that by definition includes everything that he's just finished saying. And they should teach it exactly the same way he taught them. No one's ever been given a license or the authority to change anything in the biblical plan of salvation. Have you ever played the game of telephone? It's a fun game, even for adults. The game is played by getting 15 or 20 other people together. The leader whispers a fairly complex sentence into the first person's ear. The first person then whispers that into the second person's ear, and the message gets passed on from mouth to ear for 20 generations. It can be quite hilarious when we hear that final presentation of the original sentence. Things can really change and get messed up. When a message gets passed down from generation to generation, people have a tendency to change things. But this process can't happen with the Great Commission because we have the instructions, the original message, clearly presented in the New Testament. This is my argument. The Great Commission is ongoing without alteration. The apostles would have taught their followers everything, exactly as Jesus taught them. They taught their students the four crisp commands to go, to make disciples, to baptize them, and teach them to obey everything. Nothing changed. Now think about the second generation who made disciples. What would they teach the third generation? Well, the third generation is taught to go, make, baptize, and teach. There's, there's absolutely no change. The commands are exactly the same. So, what would the third generation teach the fourth generation? Obviously, exactly the same things, without alteration. This process is handed down from generation to generation, and if we are in a church which practices the biblical plan of salvation, this is exactly what we would be doing today. If a disciple is taught and called to obey all four commands of the Great Commission, they would be making other disciples exactly the same way. A disciple makes disciples. I've said it before, there's no other kind of disciple. There's no such thing as a disciple who does not make disciples. 
We must be about the Father's business, just as Jesus was about the Father's business. Consider this challenging passage, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6. We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Wow. Can I honestly say this is how I live my life? What a challenging verse. If we're not walking in obedience to the Lord's commands, we do not know him. That's a real slap in the face, isn't it? But then John follows up his first challenging statement with an even harder hitting second statement. If someone claims to know God but does not do what he commands, John says he is a liar and the truth is not in him. How's that for a warm, fuzzy sermon? Folks, we must walk as Jesus did. That's what the Great Commission ensures. And this is why earlier I said we cannot have a relationship with God if we are walking in disobedience. Why is this command so amazing? The thing that makes the fourth command of the Great Commission the most amazing command to me is the way it kind of brings all the other three commands together. It wraps it up into a nice little package and then sets it up as the eternal repeating loop. If we are in the loop, our walk should never change. And yet, look around you. It has. Who really teaches this? Who really obeys this? Who takes the Great Commission seriously and practices it to the very best of their ability every single day? Who has set their heart on seeking and saving the lost by using the pattern of the Great Commission as opposed to some other well-meaning man-made plan, such as the sinner's prayer? When was the last time anyone asked you, who are you teaching? Is there any accountability whatsoever for these things in the church where you attend? What's happening in the churches today? Well, many churches know the Great Commission well, but tragically teach it as a goal or an ideal. They don't really practice it or hold their members accountable for it. We sacrifice active commitment to Christ's commands for a warm, fuzzy feeling which expects nothing and it sure doesn't ask for it. What would happen if someone stepped up to the plate in your church and said, hey, you know what? We're not making disciples the way they did in the first century. We need to repent and start doing it like the Bible says. In my experience, there is nothing like a team of mission-minded disciples doing the work of the Master, saving souls for an eternity of bliss in the kingdom of God. And this is why we are saved, to carry out the Master's business of making disciples. Now let's touch on another subject that we've broached in an earlier lesson, the, the A word. One important ingredient vital to make all of this happen is the one ingredient most people reject. And without it, the entire process falls flat. What is this ingredient? Accountability. If we are actively involved in the mission of making disciples, you can bet we will be talking about it with one another. If we're really doing things the right way, we should expect to see church programs and activities designed to support our efforts. And most certainly, church leadership would be interested in the results and create ways to monitor it. Look at this scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. And it goes on. God gave us leaders to prepare us for works of service, which build up the church, both spiritually and numerically. The church is meant to grow, not stay stagnant. And leaders lead. They provide direction and guidance. They give us our marching orders, so to speak, and of course, this is where the friction begins regarding accountability. 
no one naturally likes to be told what to do. No one naturally wants to be accountable for their actions or lack of action. The thought of joining a church which would hold me accountable for evangelism seems distasteful somehow. Who wants to be annoyed by someone asking them how many people that they've reached out to for a given day or a week? Is that how the church should work? Couldn't some people be offended? Couldn't some zealous leader get a little bossy about it and, and try to take control over my efforts? Yeah, absolutely. And it could really be a problem if we are thinking naturally, if we're thinking in the flesh. Remember, as a converted disciple of Jesus Christ, we don't feel like we have to do anything. We feel like we get to do something for the Lord. We see the evangelistic efforts of our church as a divine effort and our own efforts as a contribution to the whole. We're not uncomfortable when someone asks us about our evangelism or if we have a healthy, vibrant walk with the Lord. In fact, our outreach becomes good news which is celebrated and encourages the entire church. Remember, evangelism is a very good indication of how a person is doing spiritually. I stop talking about God and inviting people to learn about Him if I'm not doing well spiritually. When our hearts and our minds are not on heavenly things, we tend to get off track and begin thinking about the things of this world, not the things of the kingdom. This is the thinking of a natural man, not the spiritual man. And this is why accountability in evangelism becomes burdensome. This is a very real problem for both the shepherd and the sheep. Leaders need to possess a, a loving kindness which takes into account the fact that not every sheep will be doing awesome all the time. Leaders are to teach, encourage, and exhort the flock with great patience and careful instruction. If a leader can't love the flock this way, they should not be a leader. We should probably do a complete lesson series on accountability, but suffice to say, accountability must never become an authoritarian device. Anytime consequences are introduced, we've strayed outside the bounds of righteous encouragement. Likewise, the sheep need to be patient with the failings of the leaders. Leaders will never be perfect 100% of the time in the way they take care of the flock. There will be times they make mistakes. Their goal is to build up the flock in love, which means they should be listening carefully to your feelings and concerns. You know, leaders who can't listen and can't empathize shouldn't be leading. Paul's illustration to the Ephesians about the husband and wife relationship should serve as a great reminder of how things ought to be. Remember, Paul was talking about Christ and the church when he painted the picture of a protective, nourishing, vibrant marriage relationship. As a husband leads the family, so leaders should lead a church. So, is there a way both the lead and the leadership can share in a win-win experience? I think so. In fact, I think the answer is staring us right in the face. We, we don't see it because we forget the rest of the Great Commission. Wait, what? There's more to the Great Commission? Yeah, and it's funny how we miss it. Jesus is not done speaking to the eleven. He's got one more thing to add. And it's absolutely awesome. Why do we always forget the promise? Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faithatabase.org slash blog.